to um, say for now, welcome to everyone. And it's now my pleasure um, to hand over to, to Wojciech and his uh, colleagues at the Gollum uh, Tokamak. So Wojciech, over to you. Okay, so hello to everybody. Uh, welcome to the Tokamak Golem, uh, the educational facility at the Czech Technical University, Faculty of Nuclear Sciences and Physical uh, Engineering. I want to briefly introduce you to this uh, Tokamak and I want to also demonstrate how to operate uh, such a Tokamak. But before that, uh, let me show you a few slides covering basic information about this device, including history, uh, the general setup of this tokamak, uh, description of basic parts, and uh, finally, with the potential, uh, educational potential of such a machine. So I will uh, share my screen. Right. Okay, so this is uh, my presentation. Here is the slide covering the unique history of uh, this tokamak. So uh, this tokamak has been built uh, approximately 60 years ago at the Kurchatov Institute near Moscow uh, under the name uh, TM1 Tokamak Mali. And in 1974, uh, my colleagues from the Institute of Plasma Physics relocated this tokamak from uh, Moscow to, the, to Prague, to the Czech Academy of Sciences and under the name Castor, Czech Academy of Science Torus, and it served as a scientific machine for almost 30 years. And in 2008, we decided to relocate it once more again to the Czech Technical University, and uh, it became the, it started the third era of this Tokamak as an educational device. Uh, here we have the global schematic overview of this uh, tokamak. So, of course, in the center of the, of the experimental setup, there is a tokamak surrounded by uh, necessary infrastructure components. So, we have to evacuate the chamber. We, have, uh, we need the possibility to introduce the working gas in the vessel. And then we have these two electrical circuits. Uh, one responsible for generating the toroidal magnetic field to, to confine the plasma, since uh, Tokamak is in fact something like a magnetic bottle. And uh, this uh, electrical circuit is responsible for generating electric, uh, elect toroidal electric field uh, to break down neutral gas into plasma and uh, heating to enormous uh, temperatures. So this is the technological part of this, uh, of this device. And the second essential part is of course the diagnostic system. We have the basic and advanced systems. Uh, the basic uh, system consists of four diagnostics. This is the simple loop wire of wire in, uh, measuring loop voltage. This is reflecting uh, toroidal electric field. Here is a small coil to measure the magnetic field toroidal magnetic field, and this, uh, uh, this special coil uh, called Rogowski coil uh, measure the plasma current. And finally, we have here photo cell to measure radiation and visible part of spectrum. Uh, some typical waveforms of uh, the discharge are here from top to bottom. This is the loop voltage, toroidal magnetic field. If you have electric field, electric field magnetic field, and working gas in a uh, vessel, then you can expand the plasma and radiation. This is the simplest possible configuration if we are educational device, yeah? But what is unique here that everything, both the technological part, both these diagnostics, everything is connected to the server and server is connected to the internet. So it is possible with the help of some special software to control these technological parameters via web interface from any internet uh, browser, including, for example, your mobile phone. So this is pretty nice uh, device for educational purposes, not 
only on site but for remote education. Uh, and if you request the discharge and you can expect the, your results within one or two minutes of uh, in the form of a short homepage. So now I'm going to tell you uh, about the basic structure of the about basic components of uh, Tokamak. First of all, I need to uh, specify that in fact we are trying to create a small micro sun on the earth or in the laboratory or in the uh, future uh, fusion power plant, but unfortunately we cannot do it in the in the spherical geometry. We have to do it in a uh, toroidal uh, geometry. So this will be the geometry of the future uh, plasma. And of course, we have to cover and close everything in the vessel. And we have to equip the tokamak with the toroidal magnetic field coils. In my case of the tokamak golem, this is a 28 toroidal magnetic field coils that generate the toroidal magnetic field. And finally, uh, we have to uh, introduce also the toroidal electric field to break down neutral gas into plasma and heating that uh, we are going with the help of uh, the transformer. So if we drive the current in this primary coils that we create a magnetic flux that is directed to the central column of the transformer and generating the toroidal electric field. All together is the tokamak. So this is the vessel with the diagnostic sports, toroidal magnetic field coils and transformer uh, with the primary co coils. So uh, now I will try to show you everything in uh, reality. So here is the, uh, our tokamak. And I think that you can feel that the centrum of this tokamak is the, uh, is the vessel. You can, uh, you can see part of the vessel uh, like this. And uh, of course, uh, inside the vessel, there is a nothing. You have to fill it with the working gas. And if you introduce the toroidal magnetic field that uh, make a magnetic pressure of this, uh, uh, on this uh, plasma and force it to kind of levitate within the vessel because this, uh, the plasma cannot touch any material of, of uh, the vessel. And if you introduce also uh, electric field, then you can expect uh, the plasma in the, in the, in this tokama. Okay. So, the vessel here, we can see the aluminum boxes that uh, uh, inside these boxes, uh, we have these coils for toroidal magnetic uh, field generation. And uh, here we have the transformer core with the primary coils. And that system generates the magnetic flux that is directed toward the, uh, the central column of this transformer. and time change of this magnetic flux generated the toroidal electric field. That's all, this is the basic technology of the tokamak. Of course, we have some diagnostics, so I can show you, this is the simple loop of wire that uh, measure the loop voltage reflecting the uh, toroidal electric field. Uh, here we have a small coil that measure the toroidal magnetic field and this is the special coil uh, uh, called Rogowski coil. And this uh, in principle can measure the plasma current. And uh, here we have photodiode that can measure the uh, radiation and visible part of spectrum. So that's, uh, this, these are the basic components of uh, this tokamak and uh, also other tokamaks as well. And now I'm going to show you uh, the, how to operate such a tokamak. So this is a control room of uh, this tokamak. Uh, so this is, uh, this is the experimental uh, engineering scheme of the technology. So we, can, we have to go through the steps and set up the necessary technological parameters here. 
we can request the amount of working gas that will be introduced in the vessel. So, for example, I can request 22 millipascals and uh, of the working gas. So currently, um, I can see that we have 0.7 millipascals in the vessel, and uh, we request 22 millipascals to be introduced to be open this valve and introduce the, uh, in our case, hydrogen into the vessel. Then I will switch to set up the uh, second technological parameter that is the voltage, how to charge this capacitor that is responsible for driving the current in this total magnetic field coil. So I will ask the system to, for example, to uh, charge this capacitor up to 850 volts with this slide. And that means that we will have a uh, harmonic shape of uh, the current in these coils and the magnetic field with the amplitude approximately 0 0.3, 0 0.4 Tesla with the pulse duration uh, about 40 milliseconds. And finally, we will set up the uh, voltage, how to charge this capacitor responsible for total electric field connected to this uh, primary course. So I recommend, for example, to have a 500 volts and okay that's all and now we will uh, we will say the mission of this discharge that this will be discharged for uh, teacher day and uh, we will submit the discharge in the queue and here in this live button we can now see the engineering scheme with the metrics. And initiated. as you can hear, we are, now, we are now preparing the discharge and you will see that the system is trying to uh, prepare the working gas. So here you can see that uh, the working gas is, in, is introduced into the vessel. And now the, these two capacitors are being uh, in charging process. I will stop sharing the uh, screen and uh, I will draw your attention to this glass port. And when there is a countdown and if everything is successful, you will uh, have opportunity to see the discharge. discharge this is the countdown seven, I have to escape nine, for this moment. Eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Okay, I'm back, back. Uh, and according to the diagnostic, uh, I, can, uh, I think that according to the diagnostic, there was a plasma. So I hope that you have seen the flash of uh, the discharge. And now uh, uh, let's uh, have a look at the uh, results. So we can oh, now uh, wait for computers that okay. analyze the data. And as I can hear, everything is ready. So we can, uh, we can now see that we have made the discharge a really modest discharge with the discharge duration approximately below five milliseconds and the plasma current below 0 0.1, 0 0.2 kilo amps. Uh, in principle, we can go up to 20 milliseconds and uh, up to eight kilo amps. And this is the diagnostic slow voltage uh, waveform uh, total magnetic field and the plasma current. Okay, so uh, I will switch to my presentation back. And uh, so uh, on the road to our dream, dream uh, the fusion power plant, uh, there are the milestones, the jet, uh, ether and the demo. And so this is a real challenge. And I, uh, and I believe that all we understand that the key to fulfill such a dream, this is the education. So uh, with this small tokamak, uh, we can uh, educate the students in two regimes on site. So you can see the students doing their hands on tokamak golem experiments, making the basic estimation of the central electron temperature via uh, Spitzer formula. And since the Stokamak is possible to control remotely, you can see here the students at the Eidhoven University, 800 kilometers from Prague, 
preparing the discharge and see the results. So it's possible, for example, during the half a day to make uh, 50 discharges. Here you can see how many discharges uh, have been made uh, across the borders of the Czech Republic. And finally, I want to, uh, I want to welcome to exploit the, uh, this facility. It is possible to use this uh, within your lectures, demonstration at universities and at the secondary schools for spring, winter schools and so on training courses. So here is, my, here is the web address of this device and my address and uh, that's all from me so i have shown you the three stages of this tokamak uh, from the kuchatov institute Mo near moscow from the institute of plasma physics and uh, now educational era at the czech Technical university we are the smallest tokamak in the world probably we are the oldest for sure tokamak in the world but with the biggest control room in the world since it is possible to control it from any internet device. So thank you very much. That's all from Prague, from the Tokamak Golem, uh, the educational facility of the Czech Technical University. Thank you for your attention and bye-bye. Wojtek, what a fantastic presentation. Thank you. That was that was very inspirational. And, and I mean, the Golem Tokamak is, is quite famous in the fusion community, um, but I thought you did a great job there of explaining its mission and the fact that it is open to such a wide audience of, of users and people. Um, so, it's, I mean, I think it's fantastic. I didn't actually know much about its history. So that was, uh, I knew a little bit about it, but I didn't know so much about the history. So it's really, it's really interesting that it's, it's so, it, parts of it are so old as well, and that it has that connection back to yeah. the, back, back to the early times. So, so I'm not meant to be asking you questions, but can I just check then? It's, it's okay for people to get in, for some of the participants today to get in touch with you by email. Is that the best way? Yes. Yes, yes, and, and I think that organizers of the Fusion, Fusion Teachers Days are going to send uh, information about possibility how to exploit this uh, device. Yes, and everybody is welcome, really. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. And also, thank you so much for keeping to time. As scientists, we're often not very good at, as people who attended a lecture I gave first thing this morning will be aware, I'm not very good at keeping to time. So, Wojciech, your enthusiasm was great and you kept to time. So, so thank you. Thank you. So um, we we have to we we have to move on. Um, so um, someone actually asked a question about: Are we going to hear something more about Jet? Well, we are. I'm delighted to um, uh, that that now we're going to move over to to Oxfordshire. So we're changing countries, um, and we have um, Fernanda. I think is going to start, and also um, and and then Nick will bow. So Fernanda and Nick, please take it away. Okay. Thank you very much. Um... Just before I, before I start sharing my screen, um, I'm here from the control room at JET. There. It's reasonably empty at the moment because we are, um, we are doing some, we are not doing plasma experiments, but we are doing experiments that will lead to making a plasmas in, in the next week or so. So if I share my screen, I am not going to rediscuss the, the working of the tokamak. Um, you've seen it uh, before and, um, and it's been, Wojciech has presented it very, very well. So I will just concentrate on what JET does and I will try to highlight the, how we collaborate between physicists and between physicists and engineers. So I'm, um, I, my degree is in, physics, in physics I've been doing work in particular in tokamak operation and tokamak physics since, well, the late 80s, too long. And I've worked on JET and in other machines around the world. And the sad thing is that I'm old enough to have been involved in the experiment with deuterium tritium in JET in the 90s. This is me in the control room. As you can see, our control room is quite cold. So, You've seen a smaller tokamak in Golem and the, the, the road, uh, Wojciech also showed the road and, and JET is part of this part of this road where we are going from smaller tokamaks to ITER and then eventually to DEMO. And the, the magnetic fusion community uses all these tokamaks of varying sizes to gather data to build better physics model, to be able to predict 
more accurately the behavior of ether plasmas and of demo afterwards. And to provide also operational experience for ether, so to learn how to run tokamaks uh, from small to large. This is JET. This is the insight from JET. You will see more in uh, Nick's uh, in Nick's presentation. At the moment, is the largest operational tokamak. Is the one in closest in size to ether. It's about two in linear dimensions to ether. We are funded by the European Union, and we are operated at Calum by the UKA and a European consortium, which is called Eurofusion. So we are not operated by a single nation. JET is the only one still capable of operating with a mixture of deuterium and tritium. So we are the only ones that are capable to produce and study fusion of the type that is relevant to the reactor. So the fusion that will be delivered by ITER and then eventually by DEMO. And the other thing that makes JET very interesting is not just the size, it's not just the DT, but the fact that the inside of inside of JET is equipped with metal components that are like the ones um, planned for ITER. So metals, beryllium in the main chamber and tungsten in the laboratory. As I said, JET has done a DT experiment before. DT is the sort of the simplest form of fusion, produces um, alpha particles, the same inside the plasma and neutrons. There are energetic neutrons that escape the tokamak and are used to then produce steam and 1990s, 1991 and 97 for JET. And then there was a, uh, there was a device in the US called TFTR uh, from 1994. And the results was that we did observe, we did measure real DT fusion productions. We measured 14 MeV neutrons. This, the production of neutrons was consistent with what we expected. So there was, uh, it, it basically confirmed our expectations, our modeling but it also highlighted some plasma physics effect that were linked to the fact that we were operating uh, in a mixture of deuterium and tritium rather than, for example, hydrogen, like some smaller machines or pure deuterium. So these are, these are called isotope effects. And it's one of the things that is very interesting to study for a reactor. As I said, JET is JET is not just uh, a, single, um, a single nation or a single laboratory. JET doesn't have a scientific home team. All proposals for experiments, uh, all the physics stuff, so the stuff that does physics research come from the collaboration between the different associations uh, within Eurofusion and outside. So we have collaborations from the US as well and Brazil, for example. At JET, we've been relying on remote collaboration tools for in excess of 20 years. So since the, since the late 90s, uh, um, we've been in, we are, we are using uh, remote collaborations, which is an essential experience for future machines. And it turned out to be a very good preparation for, uh, for these um, strange times that we are in with COVID where everything is happening via Zoom. So this is, for example, a meeting that I was in in a couple of a couple of days ago, it's about 25, 25 people looking at sharing a screen and, and looking, sort of discussing data analysis, discussing modeling uh, for, for, for a particular experiment. The other thing that I would like to highlight is the, the link between physics and engineering. So the research on JET, like in other tokenat, has always relied very strongly on an interconnection between physics and engineering. So for example, when we prepare experiments, the physicists are the ones that have the original idea. They will discuss it in a team. They will discuss it with tokamak operation experts like me. Uh, and we would help translate ideas into machine parameters. But we will also discuss with the engineering staff to, to help to have their input on what we can do. Uh, for example, on how we can operate while at the same time protecting the machine from, from damage. So this, um, this relationship is, is very important and it is reflected in the way uh, the control room is laid out. 
So where I'm sitting now, it's the core of the control room, which is called the, the horseshoe there. Uh, if you've seen, this is the, this screen is the screen that you've seen behind me. Um, the session leader, so the, the person who translates between the physics and the engineering sits in the middle between the scientific coordinator, who is the person that has, that has the idea and the engineer in charge, who is the person that then has the responsibility for the machines. And they are sitting all in the same areas and all around this, this core of the whole shoe of the machine. What are we doing now? Uh, the machine, the research hasn't been stopped by COVID. We keep, uh, we keep operating the, the tokamak, we keep doing the data analysis, we keep doing all the modeling. And what are we doing at the moment is preparing on a time scale of about a week. Um, next week we'll have the first, our first experiments with tritium. Um, it will be the beginning of another round of DT experiments that will provide absolutely unique data because we are the only ones that can do it on the behavior of the plasma in the closest conditions to it. So now I'll stop sharing and I'll uh, leave you to the virtual tour of JET. There. Nick? Great, thanks very much, Fernanda. Uh, yes, hi, I'm Nick. I work uh, with Fernanda at JET as part of the communications team, and I'm going to take you on a virtual tour of JET inside the tourist room. So let me just screen share this. And here we have a virtual view of JET inside the tourist hall itself. We start off at the very base of JET, and you really get a sense, hopefully, of just how huge this machine actually is. So I can turn us a little bit around, and actually, Jet is about the size of a three-story building, so a bit over 12 meters high. And there's lots of different parts that make up Jet, and we'll show you uh, just a couple of them on this tour. So, if I fly us up here first, now we can see an overview uh, of the top of Jet. Again, just getting another sense of the scale for just how high up this machine really goes. And if I pan over to the side here, this big gray slab here is actually one of the uh, two shielding doors that we have for JET that make sure that it's contained away from all of the other areas um, of our plant so that um, no one is affected by any of the uh, radioactive neutrons that are produced or any other elements that are, getting, that are happening inside the torus hall. Take us up even further, we can actually see some of the different parts by themselves on this model. So, here we are looking at the transformer limbs, which are essential to powering the central solenoid, which creates the uh, current within our plasma. And if I enlarge this photo here, you can actually get a look at what it was when JET was being installed. And you can see just again how huge this machine is and how stripped back it was um, when it was being installed. We've now got lots of different components, all vital for the operation of this incredibly complex um, machine. The next thing that I was going to show you was what it's like with one of the magnetic coils. So I'll just spin us around here and we can isolate the colloidal coils. So there's two sets of magnetic coils on JET, the poloidal and the toroidal magnetic coils. What you can see right in the center here of these bars, these purple bars or rings going around, these are the poloidal coils. And then everything else that's attached in view are systems that are there to support or power these coils. If I enlarge this picture here, you can just get another sense uh, of where the poidal coils are actually sitting. And the function of the poidal coils is in fact to confine and shape the plasma away from the walls of uh, JET itself. Now the next set of coils that I wanted to show you was the other, the toroidal coils. The role of the toroidal coils is to 
keep the plasma within the ring-shaped vacuum vessel or the torus itself. So the Joint European Torus, or JET, it gets its name from the shape of the vacuum vessel. And that's what we're going to see next. Here we actually have a little lick inside and outside of the vacuum vessel. This is the real core of the machine itself. And you can just see actually how small in comparison the vessel is compared to the rest of the machine that's there to support the operation of what's going on inside the vessel. And here we have a little peek right inside the vacuum vessel itself. So on this model, we can get to see some of the really nice key features. I'll start us off actually at the back here. These sort of radiator looking uh, type material, this is radio frequency heating panels. And they are one of the three key mechanisms that we use to heat up jet up to 150 million degrees, making it the hottest place on earth when it's in operation. Also in view is these tiles along the inside. So you, Fernanda mentioned about the eta like wall. This is one of the key components here. These are tungsten and beryllium coated tiles that withstand some of the extreme heats felt towards the edge of the plasma. And then the last feature I'll just point out before you get towards the end of this is actually along the bottom here, this trench that you can see is called the diverter region. And that is important for exhausting any waste products that build up within the machine itself. Now, before the very end of this presentation, we really wanted to show you a pulse on jet as well. So hopefully this is what you'll be able to see next when I just dim the lights. So what you are seeing there is one of our experimental pulses, which we run when the plasma turns on and when we're creating uh, that fusion reaction. In the corner, you would have seen the video of this actual pulse running, and you may have been able to hear the sound of the actual pulse uh, that it makes as well. And then we have this really nice virtual uh, model of the plasma alongside all of this. And actually, this is what we use with our education and public visits that we're running virtually at the moment. So if you are interested, we'll be able to give you details of how uh, your school anywhere in the world right now, thanks to uh, this virtual world we live in, can see JET as well as some of the other supporting facilities that we've got at the UK Atomic Energy Authority. And right there, is the end of our Jet virtual tour. Uh, Nick, F Fernanda, th thank you very much. Um, and I, I really enjoyed that. Um, I really enjoyed that fly through. That was um, that was really nice and provided us with access that in the real world, of course, is very difficult because of all the because of because of everything that's um, that's there. Um, and exciting times coming up in the next few weeks as well. I don't know if you, if um, forgive me if the, I might have missed this. So if, 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 are you able to give just 30 seconds into the status of the DT campaign? Fernando, would you like to say? Yeah, yeah, I can say that. Uh, the DT campaign, we are beginning to, we are beginning to inject tritium in the machine next week and we'll do calibrations. And then from then on, we'll increase the level of tritium for, uh, uh, the, the full tritium campaign towards January and then a DT later on in the new year. So this is this is obviously very exciting. I'm just for, for um, people perhaps who are a bit new to fusion, a lot of machines run either with hydrogen or more commonly with deuterium. Um, so, so slightly heavy, um, so, so with only one extra 
uh, neutron. And so doing DT using the, the, the isotope mix that would be used in a reactor is particularly exciting because we can study that isotopic uh, mix. Um, Fernando, Nick, I'm sorry we don't have time to chat. I'd, I'd like if we could chat more, but uh, uh, it's my fault, but we're now, we're now beginning to run slightly behind schedule. Thank you so much uh, for that presentation. That, that was brilliant. Bye -bye. Um, so JET, as we've appreciated, is, is a tremendously important machine. I, my my non-specialist in me tells me that I'm pretty confident, biggest, biggest functioning tokamak in the world, certainly in some metrics. But now we're moving to an even bigger machine. It's my, my pleasure to introduce uh, Sabina Griffith, who's um, at the ITER site, um, who's uh, uh, down in, in the south of France, lovely part of the world, um, but also, of course, very exciting for, for fusion. Sabina. Yes, we are in southern France, but today is not really southern French weather, unfortunately. Um, so I just want to give you a little look around. So this is the view from the office. This is either big and easy chamber on the roof. And we will take you there in a minute. So my name is Sabina Griffith. I work for the Eater Communications team. And it's my great pleasure and honor to be here today and to introduce this. Yeah, it's a very, very special project for you. And uh, in short, uh, what we have done for you is we have pre recorded a little slide deck um, summarizing what either aim is to do, how it works, and where we are at. Where are we at? We have in July celebrated the official start of machine assembly. We have come a long way, it took us many years to get there, but we are now very busy. Big components are arriving day and night from the seven corners of the world. We are assembling them day and night. You will see after that slide deck presentation, my dear colleague Greg the cameraman uh, was in the assembly hall two days ago where we pre recorded uh, a little session with him standing there in front of one sector of the ETA vacuum vessel. You will see it's then here dimension. We did so. Um, not anticipating that we did well because today there's a big thunderstorm going through here. So the site is evacuated. We have to evacuate the workers then, and we would not have been able to do the live stream. So what is happening? We will show you, give you a little introduction to Eater, and then switch to the assembly hall. Last but not least from my end, we are open to visits. Despite the COVID crisis, we keep managing the arrivals, the assembly work, and the visits show. So please come around or visit our virtual tour like that we do have working tours on the internet and the website. And if you have any questions, if you need material, photos, videos, don't hesitate to contact us. Our contact details are on the website. And with that, I hand over to the presentation that was prepared by a colleague of ours, Will Eaton. Thank you very much. Bonjour, greetings. Thank you very much. My name is Will, representing the ITER organization today. We're all very honored to be a part of this FuseNet Teach the Teachers Day. So thanks to everyone for including us and thanks for doing what you do to make this a fusion community such a, a tight-knit family. So we're, we're happy to be a part of this great day. What I'm gonna be demonstrating today is something we have been building. We're calling the ITER Video Slide Deck. So there's been a lot of social science research in recent years suggesting that the normal way we do uh, PowerPoint presentations or slideshow presentations with lots of bullets and text on screen, uh, turns out there are better ways to communicate uh, with more emphasis on visuals uh, that research shows that people listening are much more able to retain the information they're getting uh, from a scientific talk if it's presented in this certain way with more visuals, with less text. And uh, we encourage you to read all about this here. Uh, great TEDx talk from Melissa Marshall, who explains this overwhelming uh, data, uh, this overwhelming research, which suggests using more visuals is a much better way to get your students or your audience to remember what you're saying. One part of the brain connecting people's words is acting in coordination with the other part of the brain, which is associating the images with the words. So I will just demonstrate the, the basic introduction to ITER uh, with these video slides, and then explain a little bit some of the other slides which are available in this PowerPoint, and we will be making this available to you. 
to use however you wish. And each slide is full of speaker's notes, which we have provided, and links to even more information online. So the, the point is, when we hand over this PowerPoint document, you can arrange the slides, use the videos in any way you like. And hopefully some of these video slides can be useful assets for you in that process. So let's just jump right in. You know what fusion is, you know how it's different from fission, you know that fusion is the process that powers all the stars in the universe, even the ones from billions of years ago whose atoms have now formed every single one of us on the planet today. So let's just talk about how fusion happens on Earth. So on Earth, scientists have been experimenting for more than 60 years on ways to confine ions and create the conditions for the fusion reaction to harness its energy. Today, the most studied method for doing this is by using a machine called a tokamak. This is a Russian acronym, which stands for toroidal chamber with magnetic coils. And yes, it is essentially a metal cage shaped like a donut with a big magnet in the center and magnetic coils all around it, making an inner magnetic cage to confine the plasma. And during the Cold War, the tokamak was a symbol of enthusiastic hope that encouraged scientists from around the world to convince their governments to work together to make fusion energy a reality for all humankind. And in the 80s, the United States and the Soviet Union formalized their commitment to this energy source of the future, and ITER was born, a multinational scientific endeavor to pool the world's resources and together build the biggest tokamak on Earth. Today, there are seven main partners and more than 35 participating nations, representing more than half of the world's population and 80% of the global gross domestic product. So by many measures, this is the grandest collaborative scientific experiment ever attempted. See, by choosing to build the components all around the world instead of just in one place, the logistics are immense. But this way, the economic rewards to the growing fusion industry can be enjoyed by every member state. So ITER itself is not going to be connected to the grid. It's not a power plant. It's a research device. So scientists will use it to conduct long pulse experiments, which will inform the design of a future tokamak power plant model called DEMO, which will really usher in the new era of fusion energy. So ITER is the last step to validate the technology before fusion power plants can start becoming a reality. There are several main goals for ITER, but two of the biggest ones to remember are, are as follows. The first goal is to achieve a Q of 10. That means to get 10 times the amount of energy out of the machine as we put into the machine. So no tokamak has yet achieved even a Q of 1, the, the break-even point of energy production. Demo is expected to reach a Q of about 25 to 40, but ITER will demonstrate a power output that scientists have been trying to achieve for decades. The second main goal is to achieve a burning plasma, the state in which the plasma fuels itself perpetually without much more input energy. The whole concept that makes fusion a virtually limitless resource, it can, it can fuel itself when it's in this burning plasma state. So ITER will only ever sustain plasmas for 400 seconds in, in duration at most for its studies, but future power plants will maintain their plasmas continuously for months or even longer. So the ITER tokamak is huge and incredibly complex from its massive components of stainless steel to the tiniest fiber optic sensors and the marvels of information technology that make it an impressive experimental tool. So without gravity on our side, we have to confine a plasma and heat it to 150 million degrees Celsius. That's 10 times hotter than the core of the sun. So to keep these hot ions from touching the walls of the tokamak, 10,000 tons of superconducting niobium titanium and niobium tin magnets storing 51 gigajoules of magnetic energy 
control the ions inside the chamber with absolute precision. There are six poloidal field coils horizontally situated in rings around the chamber, 12 toroidal field coils, giant D-shaped coils wound in double pancake layers of spiraled conductor strands, the central solenoid, a six-part, 18-meter-tall cylinder that makes up the backbone of the machine, a number of smaller correction coils, more in-vessel coils, and hydrogen pellet injection systems to prevent ELMs, edge-localized modes, which are periodic plasma instabilities that could damage the inner wall. So to make the superconductive magnets work, they need to be cooled to just four degrees from absolute zero, the coldest temperature in the universe. So just meters from one of the coldest things imaginable will be the hottest thing in the solar system. So providing the high vacuum, ultra cool environment of the ITER vacuum vessel is the 3,850 ton cryostat, which acts as a giant thermos with more than 200 penetrations, providing access for cooling systems, magnet feeders, auxiliary heating, diagnostics, and more. And it sits on large bellows, allowing for thermal contraction and expansion of the structure during operation. It was a very amazing and emotional day when the cryostat base was lowered into position in the Tokamak pit. I was there, there were people who had literally spent almost 40 years preparing for this moment. And uh, there were more than a few tears of celebration shed that afternoon. So we're on the way to fusion. And indeed, ITER means the way in Latin. And ITER is certainly helping lead the way to the global goal of achieving fusion energy. But uh, it's always important to remember that the way, this way, is a many branching road that connects researchers and governments and cultures around the entire world and brings us all further on the road to a fusion future. So there are other tokamaks coordinating their research to focus on the same questions that ITER will be asking and answering. So as we look at the energy needs of the future and seek to include fusion on the energy menu, we can once more make the case for ITER in this way. For one, it's clean. Unlike fission, fusion requires no long-lived radioactive waste. The only hazardous materials left behind by ITER will be in the activated surfaces of the machine itself, which, once it sits in place for just 100 years after operation, will be free from any dangerous radioactivity, and the materials can actually be recycled for use in other fusion plants. Two, it's abundant. The two main ingredients for fusion fuel are available worldwide. Deuterium in all the world's oceans and lithium, a common element found naturally around the world. The ITER tokamak will recycle and repurpose these input ions to breed its own tritium fuel to sustain deuterium-tritium reactions. It's safe. There's no chance at all of a dangerous meltdown like with fission plants. There's only ever less than four grams of fuel in the reactor at any given time, and the reaction itself is not dangerous because it's so sp specific. It, if conditions aren't perfectly met inside the machine, the reaction basically just stops. And finally, E for everybody, because the fusion industry touches countless other industries, so that all of the companies in all of the countries involved are empowered by their government ITER contracts to put themselves to work pioneering brand new industries in the process with the, the uses for all the innovative technologies being developed because of ITER and fusion are, are limitless from the magnets, cryogenics, sensors, remote handling, material science, you name it. You know, hundreds of other disciplines are involved. So as the challenges of the planet's energy crisis continue to multiply, such an investment in ITER and in fusion right now could A, spark economic booms for new industries around the world, and B, maybe make the difference we need to guarantee the descendants of humanity the clean and prosperous future they deserve. So on the road to fusion, we all walk the way together. 
So thank you very much. That's the end of uh, our presentation for now. You know, we imagine that you might want to give as teachers a similar presentation that I just did this intro basics of ITER presentation to your class. Then perhaps assign uh, the PowerPoint slide deck to your students who could give their own presentations using some of the additional slides. So sincerely from all of us at ITER, thank you very much. I think we've got a couple minutes left in our presentation to bring you a few more updates from the work site. So we'll cut to that next, but uh, that's it for me. Good luck to you all very much. I certainly hope to be seeing you around in this fusion community. So, merci beaucoup et bon chance, mes amis. Hello, I'm Greg de Temerman. I'm a scientist here at the ITER organization. I work on edge plasma and plasma wall interactions. And we're here today in the assembly hall where the machine is being assembled. As you might know, ITER has reached a critical milestone over the summer with the start of the tokamak assembly. So from now on, things become real. We go from design to the time where the machine is really, really being uh, built. So what happens around me is that a lot of components are arriving here from all over the world, and they are being prepared in this giant hall, which is about 60 meters high. What you see here just behind me is the first sector of the vacuum vessel, the so-called sector six. Uh, the vacuum vessel of ITER is made of nine uh, sectors with two toroidal field cords on each sector. So this is the first one which is coming from Korea. You see how big it is uh, and how challenging it is to actually assemble. So this sector will actually be unbended and put on the uh, tools that you see behind me, which are the subsector assembly tools, where the aim is that you have one sector of the vacuum vessel, the thermal shield, and then two toroidal field cords, which are assembled. Then everything is lifted by giant cranes and then transported uh, on, the, on my left inside the tokamak pit where everything is assembled. So far, the first components which have been installed are the base of the cryostat, which is the heaviest component of the, of the machine, about 1,250 tons. Then the first cylinder came on top of it, uh, which is forming half of the, of the cryostat. Remember that the cryostat is about 30 meters high and 30 meters in diameter. And then you start the machine assembly with the first sectors which have to come in. So this is a very exciting time. You can see actually how big the components are and why it is actually so challenging to uh, get ITER to, to run. We expect that the assembly will last for about four years before we can start integrated commissioning and before we can get into first plasma at the end of 2025. Uh, this is a very exciting time for scientists because what we have been working on for so long is now starting to become real. The machine we have been uh, dreaming, we have been working on is actually uh, getting in place. And this is a very big boom for fusion because the biggest machine in the world is actually now in the final stage of assembly. So um, thank you everyone. Thank you, uh, Sabina uh, and team at, at ETA for that. Um, so we've only got a couple of minutes left of this, this international session. We've been having some, some great questions uh, come in. Um, and I've, we've got some, I fear we might not have time to answer some really great questions about lithium supply, um, about how fast we can turn a tokamak on and off. That's a really good, that's a really interesting question. Um, had a great question as well about stability of funding and and the the society, um, sort of the geopolitical risks, if you like, associated with, with fusion. And indeed, one of the things that struck me as we've been talking is that one of the really exciting things about fusion is that it's this interplay between the, the if you like, the hardcore science, this really super technical science and engineering um, combined with this societal need um, and and the whole interplay between that. If we're going to make fusion a success, we don't just need the scientists and engineers, although that's crucial, but of course we also need uh, the politicians, the lawyers, um, the and of course, essential to all of this, uh, we need we need educators so that not not that whether we should have fusion or not is a foregone conclusion, but so that people can talk um, in in a sophisticated way about the about the um, about the issues. Um, uh, ITER, by the way, I just want to comment is the most amazing thing. It's like science fiction, except it's really there. I've I last went to ITER I guess about eighteen months ago for the Fusenet PhD event. Um, I was hosting part parts of that. And just the scale of the thing is enormous. I don't know if this is an urban myth, but my understanding is that the largest truck in the world with 208 wheels, I couldn't count them all, but it's the biggest truck I've ever seen, um, was built for ITA to get some of the components from the port um, down near Marseille up to up to ITA. The, just the engineering 
is out of this world. So if you get the opportunity, do go and look at the, the Eater site. Anyway, I'm meant to be stopping talking. I'd like to say some big thank yous. Um, big thank yous particularly to um, from the from the FuseNet Executive Office, uh, to Luke and to Marion and to Guido for, for doing all the organising. I'd like to speak, I'd like to thank um, our contributors in this international session. I'd, I'd of course like to thank our contributors in the local session. Um, but most of all, I'd like to thank you, the teachers, uh, for coming along. Please do give it the comments we've had during the session have been great. And sorry, we haven't got to all of them. Please do let us know whether this has been something that's been valuable. Are there some things we could do next time? Should we have a next time? Um, to Have we got the balance right? Are there different issues we should be thinking about? Should we do the same thing again or should we do something different? Uh, please tell us. Um, uh, we will share all the material that there, there, will, there might be some little copyright issues here and um, copyright's the wrong word, but but the, the, we have to check that we can share every single slide, but certainly the vast bulk of the material that we've shared today, we will make available on the FuseNet website. Um, and we will also be distributing certificates of attendance so that you can say that you've been here. Um, and um, the final thing for me, so, so I hope I've said thank you to everyone. Thank you so much for making this uh, uh, the, the uh, a great success. Um, and I can also, I'm to, pleased to announce that the next thing is that all the domestic sessions will now be um, available for people to go back to and um, uh, and, uh, and 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 have any uh, questions answered or at least addressed um, from this session. So it's goodbye from us here in the international FuseNet session. Um, but if you have the time and the availability and you'd like to, please do do go back using the Zoom links that were circulated uh, for your domestic session to go back and join your your domestic team. Uh, please stay in. It's it's been great having everyone uh, join today. Please do stay in touch uh, with the with the uh, fusion community. We are so keen to work with you. So thank you and goodbye for now.